Thank you, Brother Bankers. <laughs> Utopia, Texas was mentioned. This is my wife's hometown. Her great-grandfather was the first white man in the whole area. He fought with Sam Houston at San Jacinto, and his name's on that monument down there. And on both sides of her family, for four or five generations, they're ranchers. So my wife's a rancher in the family, and I go down there, and she makes me dig ditches and build fence, and the work nearly kills me, and I have to get back to my preaching. <laughs> <coughs> and Claude... Uh, Guy, mentioned Paradise, Texas. That's up here in Wise County. Well, I was born and reared in Paradise, but not Paradise, Texas. <laughs> Thalia, Ford County, Texas. And the word is Indian, and it means Paradise, and it's on Paradise Creek. <laughs> so Paradise and Utopia have been married Come in September, Lord willing, be 50 years. Now, don't ask my wife how we've gotten along during that time. She might not think it as paradise or utopia. Anyway, it's good to be here. I have regretted that I've been unable to attend these lectureships the last several years. I've been out of town either holding meetings or on other activities and couldn't be here. And these three lectures we heard this morning, really sermons, well, that's what they were from Brother Taylor, Brother Guile, and Brother Stanbow, were just right down the heart of... I didn't get that name right, did I? <laughs> Stanbow. I asked, him, I asked him this morning how to pronounce it, and he told me, and now I've forgotten. I said, is that Polish? And I believe he said Czech. Is it Czech? Is that right? Je <laughs> well, anyway, uh, they were all excellent sermons right down the line, and they need a lot of preaching. And this is a good lectureship, and I'm glad to be here today and share it. I was asked to speak on what I have learned in 50 years of preaching. I preached my first sermon in October of 1928. So I'm in my 55th year of preaching, but as a boy growing up in my home congregation, I made talks to our small group and, uh, you know, a few things like that. And I sort of considered them sermons at the time, though the brethren didn't. But anyway, I've been preaching quite a long time, and I've had a very happy ministry, as I'm sure all of you preachers have, at least you should have. And uh, if I had my life to do over again, I would want to do nothing but preach the gospel. I remember a very godly grandmother who destined me to the ministry and the influence of my father and mother. My father was an elder in the church, and my mother became a Christian when she was 12 years old, died in 1969 at 85, and was a member of the same congregation for 73 years. And she taught me the way of the Lord, as did my father taught me to appreciate gospel singing, which I enjoy, had me to memorize quite a number of the psalms, which I can still quote. And I recall my father, we often kept the preacher during the summer meeting, and my father, for a farmer and an uneducated man, was quite well versed in the scriptures. And he always wanted to sit up till 12, 1 o'clock and discuss the Bible with the preacher. And sometimes he'd try to bait the preacher with some false argument, false doctrine to see how much he knew. And uh, usually the truth came out. But I can remember sitting on the porch in the summertime way into the night and listening, listening. One of those preachers was Brother C.E. Wooldridge and his son Charles led our prayer. And Floyd Wooldridge sitting by him over here. Another member at Skillman, both sons of Brother Woolridge, and he held uh, about 12 meetings in our hometown over the years. He performed the ceremony when my parents were married way back when, and he's been a very dear and close friend. We've been close to the Woolridges for three or four generations, and we love and appreciate them, and his memory and that of Sister Woolridge is very revered. Well, I don't know what to say. I could just say... In one sentence, in 54 years, I haven't learned a thing. <laughs> that might be near to the truth. But uh, on the other hand, I can truthfully say 
that I don't know as much now as I did when I started preaching. <laughs> because when I started preaching, I knew it all. I knew all the arguments, and I knew, I thought, the correct position on every point. And I really thought, as a teenage preacher, that all you had to do was convert the denominational people was just to show them the truth, and they'd immediately accept it. All they needed was just to be enlightened. I soon learned better. Anyway, I had a very happy ministry the first several years of my life. I was reared out in East Tex uh, West Texas, and when I came out of Harding College, I taught school several years and preached, and back then there were no local preachers to speak of between two or three between Fort Worth and Amarillo, and uh, many small rural congregations, and I had a lot more places to preach than I could, uh, could meet, and during the summer I held meetings all the time, and uh, by the time I was 21 years old, I guess I had held 30 or 35 gospel meetings, and I got a lot of experience because there weren't any other preachers available, and the brethren were kind enough to put up with me and listen to me and occasionally, not often, brag on me a little bit. But anyway, I feel sorry for young preachers today that start out and they have no place to preach. Every place in Texas has a congregation almost, has a full-time salaried minister, and brethren are not quite as willing today to listen to some of these uh, young, inexperienced brethren, as they ought to be. And so I, my heart goes out to them. You learn to preach by preaching. Amen. You don't learn to preach by sitting on the front uh, pew listening to somebody else. And my advice to any preacher is, if you want to preach the gospel, get out and preach. If you have to go to Podunk or Timbuktu or wherever, out in the crossroads or wherever, uh, preach. Well, there are a lot of things I would like to say. First of all, I have learned how really indebted I am to so many people, to my grandparents and to my father and mother, to being reared in a Christian home. My father was a Baptist when Dad and Mama married, and he was pretty set in his ways. My mother and grandmother before her took the firm foundation. I don't know how long it's been coming in our family, and uh Old Brother Joe Warlick here in Dallas published the Gospel Guide. Some of you remember that. I was reared on those two papers and in later years subscribed to the Gospel Advocate. I told Ira North one time when he said it's the old unreliable, and he corrected me in a hurry, Brother Taylor. Anyway, it's a great paper. And I'm very grateful to my parents and the influences that helped me to become a preacher. I cannot remember even in my earliest recollections when I never intended to be and didn't want to be a preacher. And I was reared in the church, sort of on the front seat, and our home was the preacher's home, and I've been around preachers a lot. And I remember reading the Firm Foundation back when it was a newspaper type, and it had five or six, seven full-size pages of reports, preacher bragging, some of the brethren called it. <laughs> And I read those, and I reveled in them, and I knew a lot of our preachers by name long before I met and became personally acquainted with them. I talked to Rule Lemons two years ago. I said, you ought to put more reports in the paper, and he doesn't agree with that. He says, oh, that's preacher brag, but I never shall forget the thrill as a boy growing up that I had in reading reports, not only from Texas, but Tennessee, and Oklahoma and everywhere, and this encouraged me, and I wish we had more of that in the papers. Of course, we've all got church bulletins now. I get, I guess, at least an average of 25 church bulletins every day, and I try to get them read before the week is over, and I certainly am happy to follow the news of the brethren and so on. But anyway, I'm very grateful for the influence that gospel papers have had in my life and reading the Firm Foundation the Gospel Guide, as well as my mother's teaching, converted my father, and he was an elder in the church. And so I'm indebted to them. I, I'm indebted to my college professors. I went to Harding College. Brother Jan Armstrong was president. He was a great and a good man. He was a man who 
could make you want to go to heaven more than anything else and want to serve the Lord in the mission field. Great motivator. Well, the L.C. Sears was dean just two or three weeks ago. Virgil Bentley gave me two volumes Brother Sears has written, his autobiography, and a, a book of sermons, Keys to Happiness, an exposition of the graces in First uh, Second Peter 1. And uh, these are tremendous sermons. Brother Sears is 87 years old now. And I think of them, Brother B.F. Rhodes, Brother S.A. Bell, under whom I took Bible. And I'm greatly indebted to the great influences they had of me. And I'm indebted to a lot of preachers, many of whom are already dead and gone, some of whom still live, and they have meant a great deal to me. I mentioned Brother Woolridge. Perhaps my family had been closer to Brother Woolridge, Brother C.E. Woolridge than any other preacher because he was there for so many meetings. I remember Brother Foy Wallace, Jr., whom we lost just three or four years ago. He came to our town when I was a boy and held numerous meetings. And he and I were associated through the years in many different ways, and I loved and appreciated him, and he loved and appreciated me, and I had a personal letter from him about three or four days, maybe a week it was, just before he died. And I remember the fine preaching he did and the great work he's done in his debates. He lives on in his books and so on. Man. And I remember great preachers like C.R. Nickel and J.W. Chisholm and Brother Thomas E. Milholland and Brother G.C. Brewer and Brother H. Leo Bowles and uh, N.B. Hardiman and a lot of these brethren. In later years, I had the privilege of being associated uh, in preaching capacities with these and other brethren, and they have enriched my life and many preachers living today. And many of you here, I see Norman Gibson here when we started our TV program in 1957. Norman was with us on that program as narrator. But Lloyd Smith, who preaches at Plano, said he would be here. He and I were in Harding together, and we worked in Oklahoma together and uh, been very close to him. Hewlin Jackson, Brother Guile, and so many of you, brethren, and Brother Joe Malone, whom I've known so long, and Fred McClung, he was the one who should have gotten this speech because he's been preaching a lot longer than I have. Uh, uh, he, he sat where Moses sat. And uh, uh, so he goes back a long, long way. I don't know whether Fred's in the audience or not, but you can quote me on that. Brother C.C. C. Abbott back there, I see he and I have labored together many times. Brother Melvin Wise in Dallas, and I was so pleased Sunday afternoon to be at Walnut Hill Church when they honored him with a retirement party. It really wasn't retirement because he's still working as hard as he ever has as an associate there and so on, and had a great program, and uh, they presented him with $18,000, the amount of his home mortgage, and I called Sister... I think it's the only time I heard, ever heard Melvin break down and cry and could hardly respond. But anyway, I think that was so nice, and he's such a lovable preacher, and so many, many others. I'm indebted to preachers. I love preachers. I know some of you can't preach much, and some of you, <laughs> and I know some of you are wrong when you disagree with me, but uh, there's nobody I love and appreciate more than preachers. I've heard people say, well, he doesn't preach like brother so-and-so. Well, so what? It's a good thing the Lord didn't make us preachers all from the same mold. And if we all preached in the same way and the same emphasis and so on, it'd be mighty dull and boring. I was telling Claude Guile a minute ago, I like to hear him preach. It puts a lot of fire. And I used the word spizzerink to him. He didn't know what that meant. <laughs> but uh, down here in Texas, Brother Guile, we know. <laughs> incidentally, incidentally, where'd you get that word far? I never heard that in Texas in all my life. He said in his lecture, he's back in Texas and he's calling it far. That sound more like Tennessee or Mississippi to me. And did you notice... Uh, before he got through after saying that he pronounced it far, that 
he got over there in Revelation 3 and he said, Thou art neither cold nor hot. Did you catch that? Neither? <laughs> now, Claude, if, if you want to stay in Texas, you better say either and neither. Now, I don't know how they do it over in Tennessee, but uh, you better get off of that neither business, brethren. <laughs> Brethren think your orthodox is a little suspect anyway, and they'll sure know that you are unsound if you go with that. Well, anyway, one thing I want to say. Jesus said in John 4, 38, other men have labored and you've entered into their labors. Brethren, there's a verse we ought to meditate upon. Realize the many people who've gone before us. We think of the men of the Restoration like Camel and Stone and Raccoon John Smith, people who made sacrifices to bring the cause of New Testament Christianity to the shores of America. And we think of the second generation of men of the Restoration and the third generation. And we think of the church where it is now. I love the church and appreciate it. And I think I can appreciate it as much as any of you because I've seen it come a long way in, in our day. When I started preaching in 1928, there were a lot of towns, even county seat towns in West Texas that had no congregation. Many areas in Texas. East Tennessee didn't have many congregations then. Various parts of Oklahoma, they had none. And now we have congregations everywhere. When I started preaching, perhaps... Not even 5% of the congregations had local preachers. There weren't that many preachers available, and then the brethren didn't think they could support them. And those that were salaried preachers lived on a pittance, and as I experienced in my first local ministry, had to wait a few weeks sometime to get my weekly salary. So we've come a long way financially, numerically, and spiritually, and so I, I'm very happy about the church. It has a great, a great history, and we must remember this. We need to look backward and remember the old paths and brethren who have made it possible. One many years ago when our buildings were all just little frame buildings, and there were no classrooms, and there were no facilities for Bible study, no Baptist, sir, that's right. I can remember in my hometown when the idea of a building came and a baptistry, a lot of objection to it. Where do you find it? In Scripture. You know, I used to sort of ridicule brethren who held views like that. Some brethren used to argue you can't have in, uh, what they call uninspired literature quarterly, such as you write. <laughs> and you can't... <laughs> Well, it wasn't yours then, Brother Taylor, but anyway. I heard, this is the truth, I can remember it. I was about 13 years old, and a preacher came through Thalia, and he preached, and he was one of these uh, non-class uh, brethren who were against what he called uninspired literature. That is the Firm Foundation Quarterly. That's all we had then. And he used a sermon outline right here on the pulpit to prove that it is wrong to use uninspired literature in teaching. <laughs> and even as a boy, I could see that inconsistency. And I remember when the one cup issue was live and the idea of communion sat, my old Uncle Luke Johnson, Brother Wooldridge, knew him well, stayed in his home. Uncle Luke was sort of the leader and he studied the Bible. He wanted to be right about everything, but he was never wrong in anything from his point of view. But he was a good man. He wanted to do right, and he didn't believe that you should have a communion set. Of course, we had two glasses. My grandmother, his sister, ordered a communion set in the firm foundation. She prepared the communion and had a cloth over it. You know, we had the Holy Shroud over the Lord's Supper then. <laughs> and uh, I say that respectfully. Anyway, he got up to wait on the table, and I never shall forget. He looked at it. He saw this communion set, and he blushed, and he, <clears throat> he didn't know what to do. But he finally went ahead with it. Well, anyway, that settled it. Now, it's easy for us to laugh and ridicule brethren like that, but... 
Their one desire was to be right, to be scriptural. And they wanted you to prove that it was scriptural. They weren't always able to determine the difference between law and custom. Some of us haven't learned that yet. And later on, when we talked about having a, a drinking fountain in the church building and uh, restrooms and even a kitchen, God forbid, We've come a long way. We've learned that a building is a tool to be used for the cause of Christ. Amen. And the idea that a building per se is sacrosanct is a Catholic, not a biblical concept. I'm not saying we just ought to do everything and anything in the building, but a building is a useful tool, and we're the church, not the building. But anyway, those brethren back then, they wanted to be right. Now, we need to get back to that. Sometimes people are saying today, well, it doesn't matter how you do it, just so you get it done. That's wrong. And some people are saying, well, let's don't try anything. We might, we might go astray. So there is a happy medium there. So I'm grateful to the past, and I'm grateful to the church of today. And we have many good elders. Our elderships today are a lot better than they used to be. Maybe some of them don't know the Bible as well as some of the older elders used to, but more of them know the Bible, and more of them work in the church and do the work of pastoring, and this is one of the reasons why the church has grown and developed. And I think in many ways we have better preachers today. Maybe there are many exceptions to that. We had a lot, a few of good preachers back then. We have a lot of good preachers now, and we all need to improve, and so... I'm more optimistic about the church today than pessimistic. I believe there's a lot more to praise and commend than there is to condemn. Now, that isn't to put our heads in the sand and say that we don't have problems today. We do, but we always have. Paul encountered problems in Corinth. He didn't write the church off. He just sought to correct them. And so we need to realize that, but we must stay with the book. We need to preach the gospel the whole gospel and nothing but the gospel. We need to stay with the Bible, and that's what those brethren did back there. I was reared in a time in the first 10 or 15 years of my ministry when we had a lot of public debates, and uh, I can remember how interesting they were. The fire got a little hot at times, and sometimes even our brethren said some things they shouldn't have said and all of that, but they did a lot of good, and a lot of people were converted. Back then, when you came to hold a meeting, seldom did you hold a meeting that you weren't challenged by the Baptist, Methodist, somebody for a public debate. Amen. And uh, you had to defend the truth. And so I, I think they did a lot of good. And I wish that we had many of them today. And if we really had them in the way they used to have them, do a lot of good. Guy Woods, editor of the Gospel Advocate, I guess, has held more than... 200 debates, more than anyone in our brotherhood, I think, living now. And I remember his first debates. I attended the first several of them. And he started out West Texas debating. He's done a great deal of good. Well, anyway, so much for that. But, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. He had a question box. I can remember, I think I was 20 years old. I went to Abilene to hold a meeting, one of the congregations. And the preacher got up and he said, here's a question box. So you put any question there you want and Brother Bannister will answer it. it scared me to death. <laughs> I mean, it did. Yeah. And I got up. I had sense enough to say, well, I probably can't answer, but he can and will. <laughs> so I put the, put the book on him. Well, so much for a lot of experiences. I have learned through these years of preaching, the value of Bible study. I study the Bible a lot, as you do, several hours a day, and it's been my habit many years to rise real early in the morning and study and read the Scriptures. And the more I study, not only the more do I understand, but the more I appreciate the Word. And we need to stay in the Word, not only in our personal lives, but in our preaching, our teaching. Yeah. And I've learned to appreciate the Bible. I'm like you. I've read a lot of books about the Bible and so on, but we must stay with the Bible. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. 
The Bible is so interesting. It's so intriguing. I can hardly lay it down. And I do not appreciate the expression you sometimes hear, brethren. Well, the Bible's just too dry. Well, you really reveal yourself when you say that. You're not familiar with it. No wonder it's dry. But the Bible is so interesting. Feeds your soul, strengthens you. I'm intrigued as I study the Bible how through the years I have overlooked some very obvious truths. There's a uh, proof of the inspiration. You mentioned the inexhaustible depths of the Bible. I was reading the other day, 1 Peter 4 and 2, and it jumped out at me about three months ago that he should no longer live the rest of his time to the lust of the flesh, but to the will of God. The rest of his time. That phrase caught my attention. How much more time do I have? Only God knows. Won't be many years at most, but how should we spend the rest of our time? One year, ten years, twenty, thirty, forty. Not to the lust of the flesh, but the will of God. The rest of our time. And I've meditated upon that a great deal since. And I think if we'll think about it, we'll resolve to live the rest of our time. Howsoever much God may see fit to give us to the will of God. And I'm sure you preachers have shared this experience. You have studied passages or verses or texts, and you saw good sermons, but you didn't feel up to them. And you had to study more and become more experienced in order to preach them. I think I have preached from every book of the Bible and every chapter of the Bible, and uh, there's one passage of Scripture that to this very day I have never preached a sermon on, and I've won two for 30 years. And I have never felt up to it, and I still don't. And it's in Deuteronomy 3, verse 24. Moses, in his valedictory address, said, Lord, thou hast begun to show me thy greatness and thy mighty hand. 120 years old. He saw the greatness of God in his childhood, in his maturity in Egypt. He saw, he saw the glory of God yonder in the land of Midian, the burning bush. He saw the glory of God in Egypt and all of these plagues. And the sea opened up, and the cloud leading them a day, the pillar of fire by night. He saw the miracles in the wilderness. He saw God on Mount Sinai. And he saw so many things. And imagine a man with 120 years of experience walking with God, saying, you've just begun to show me your glory. I hope sometime I'll be able to Get a sermon on that text. Now, if any of you have preached on it, well, let me know. But I just have never felt up to that text. Maybe I will sometime. Well, anyway, I have learned to appreciate the greatness of Christ, the greatness of his church, the greatness of the gospel. I've learned to appreciate how powerful the gospel is. One of the most amazing things to me is that how men such as you and I, gospel preachers, with all of our faults and failures, with our shortcomings and with our proneness to mistakes and error, how the Lord can take us and use us and reach and convert and transform the lives of people. The gospel is the power of God and salvation, not the preacher, not his learning, not his rhetoric, not his personality, not his travels, not his experience, not his family. The gospel is the power of God. And no matter how poorly we may proclaim, if we are proclaiming the gospel, God's power is flowing through us into the minds, the hearts of people, and this is what will convert people. We need to get back to gospel preaching. One thing I hear that distresses me, and I know this can be exaggerated, and I think it is. Uh, some people say, well, I just don't hear gospel sermons like I used to. Well, we need to get back to the old-fashioned preaching a great deal. I know there are some issues today that we didn't address back years ago, but we don't have any new situations today. The world's the same as it always been. Human sin, human corruption, human need, human 
everything is the same old gospel story, just as beautiful and true, just as full of Jesus' power as it was when it was new. And we need to dedicate ourselves to it. We need to believe in the power of the gospel. I fear that we are relying on gimmickry too much to try to convert the world. Right. Now, there is a difference between methodology and gimmickry, and we all understand that. But you don't convert people by gimmickry. You convert them by preaching the Word of God. And if I'd have anything to say to us, brethren, I'd say let's preach the Word faithfully. Well, several things. I have made up my mind, and I'm trying to learn this, although... I haven't succeeded. First of all, to be optimistic, and by nature, I'm an optimistic person. I'm not pessimistic about the world situation. I do not believe the world is in a worse condition today than it's ever been. Any student of history knows better than that. History has its peaks and its valleys. We may be in one of those valleys today, but Christ spoke of his age as a sinful and adulterous generation. Paul spoke of his age as a perverse generation. And we have nothing new in human history. And I believe, as the book of Revelation teaches, that righteousness will ultimately prevail and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And I believe God will have the last word. People talk about blowing up the world with the atom bomb. It'll never happen that way unless God wills it. Because God, not man, not rulers, is going to terminate this world. And so, whatever happens, God is in control. Browning said that God's on his throne and all's well with the world. Well, all may not be well with our world today, but one thing for sure, God's on his throne. And God will blow the whistle, not man. God will call the final shot. And so, everything's going to turn out all right. So I'm optimistic, and I'm optimistic about the future of the church, and I'm optimistic about a lot of things. Another lesson I'm trying to learn, I'll hurry here, is to rise absolutely above fear. Have you ever noticed in the scripture how many times we're taught not to fear? Christ said, fear not, be not afraid, let not your hearts be troubled. As I go about holding meetings, I sense a lot of people in the church, they, they seem to be running scared. They're afraid and they're filled with fear. But we need to rise above fear. The fear of old age. Well, we're all going to get old if we keep living. And there's only one alternative. <laughs> and so, grow old gracefully. I go three or four times every week to see Brother Tillett S. Tedley, gospel preacher, songwriter. 97, be 98, June the 3rd, Lord willing. And I've never seen a person grow old so beautifully, so gracefully. It's really joy to be in his presence. He really puts you on cloud nine. And I've made up my mind, if the Lord lets me live until I'm an old man, <laughs> that I'm going to grow old gracefully and optimistically and not be crotchety and grumbling and grouching about everything and everybody. Deliver me from some old grouchy person. So I'm trying to learn that. And in spite of uh, illness or whatever, to rise above fear. The fear of the future, it's in God's hand. The fear of dying, it is appointed unto man once to die. Christ has conquered death. We're sure of the resurrection, so what does it matter? Whether I live another day, another hour, another week, another month, another year, or many more years, doesn't matter. It's better on the other side. So why worry about things like that? And why, why worry about facing the judgment? We shall all stand before God to be judged. When Paul preached to Felix, he caused him to be terrified. The reason of righteousness and temperance and the judgment to come. But we oughtn't have any fear of the judgment. First John 4, 17, Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. And if we are serving the Lord and we're in his care and keeping, everything's well and it's going to come out all right. And so we need fear none of these things. We need just to fear in the sense of reverency, to fear God and keep his commandments. 
This is the whole duty of man, and this is the thing that counts. And just one other thing. I have made up my mind long ago, as I'm sure you have, that God being my helper, that I'm going to heaven. In fact, I know I'm going to heaven. Well, how do you know that? You're not all that smart. I don't know very much. But I know that I can know that I'm going to heaven. A lot of brethren are running scared, and they don't know whether they're saved or not. They don't know whether they're going to heaven or not. Well, maybe I think I might possibly make it with the skin of my teeth. Well, it's not Christianity. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto the salvation to be revealed the last time. God's power, not our power, is what keeps us on the condition of our faithfulness. And if we're faithful, and that's a relative term, we'll be in heaven, and we're assured of heaven. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. And we're assured of the crown of life if we're faithful. Faithfulness is relative. doesn't mean perfection. We don't have to be perfect to go to heaven. If we do, we'll not make it. Here is a good, faithful husband, but whoever saw a perfect husband? Even Roger Johnson here from Houston is not a perfect husband. I don't have to ask his wife. <laughs> but he's faithful. And so we need to be faithful to the Lord. And one thing, and the only thing I want to hear at the judgment is, well done, good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful. That's all that matters. That's all that really counts. And so as I look into the future that's in the hands of God, and I remember in Psalms 31, David said, My time is in thy hand. I look forward to a glorious future in this life as long as God lets me live, and of course in the life that is to come. And I am sure that's the way you feel, and that's the way we all ought to feel. Fifty-four years preaching, I hope the Lord will give me another 20 or 30. I don't know. It doesn't matter. And I don't worry a bit about it. Just try to live day by day and leave tomorrow in the hands of the Lord and grow in faith and knowledge. I haven't learned this very well yet, but I'm trying. I'm like Paul in Philippians 3. I haven't attained it yet, but I'm pressing on. And that's the way we all should feel. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, John. God bless you and the blessings of God upon each and every preacher. At 1.30, we'll be dealing with the homiletical Jesus by Roy Lanier, Jr., and then the open forum that is uh, conducted by Robert Taylor. I was going to say controlled, but conducted (laughs) by Robert Taylor. And then we we have a great evening in store for us with messages from Hewlin Jackson, Jesus, Power, and Human Need, Bill Humble, Jesus, Teaching on the Judgment. Great lectureship, and you have made it the greatness of it because you're here. You're participating in it because of your love for the Lord and for His Word. It's so wonderful to be here today. Tomorrow at this time, we'll be talking about the humorous things that have happened in our lives, predominantly preachers. Some of the members might be here too and want to share with that, Eddie. Uh, some of the things they're humorous about us. But anyway, uh, whatever. I know we'll have a great lunch in store for us. Don't know how well we, I don't think all of us can stand together, but Perry Cotham, would you word us in a prayer and then we'll be dismissed.